Thank, thank you, Mark. And I want to thank also the Architecture School of Georgia Tech for this invitation. I'm really pleased and very happy to be able to present some stories, some European stories from the know-how, the knowledge that we've been kind of achieving uh, in the last uh, 33 years through uh, this award. An award is something that is given, that sometimes it has a lot of glamour, uh, sometimes it does not. But in any case, uh, what's really interesting is that it has brought us to, uh, it has given us the possibility of knowing or seeing, being able to have a certain distance and seeing what has been happening the last 30 years. It's always difficult to discuss on really uh, contemporary architecture, recent uh, pieces or uh, uh, constructions and so on, but uh, 30 years starts to be already a kind of timeline in which we can start seeing uh, some things. And this would not have been possible without the construction or the reconstruction of the Barcelona Pavilion by Lili Reich and Mies uh, van der Rohe in uh, 1929. So I'll start with this once upon a time story in which we had a Barcelona, 1929, which decided to transform part of the city and it decided to organize this international exhibition in which it would invite a series of countries from all over uh, the world and it would present its cultural development and and each country would also present their last technologies. For example, the Zeppelin on its way towards Brazil stopped for some days in Barcelona so that everybody could admire it from La Ramblas, from Montjuic. And the opening was also one of the days in which people could see that Zeppelin going over the city and could start admiring the products that had been brought by the different countries, but also the different constructions that the different countries had built in Barcelona. Here we see Mies van der Rohe walking with a series of other people from Germany and some images of some of the spaces that they designed in Barcelona, not this one. Uh, this one was the silk industry that he had done before. But he did design not only the pavilion, but also a series of other spaces around this area. Here we see Mies van der Rohe speaking to the King of Spain, Alfonso XIII, during the opening. So it's interesting to see this context in which the pavilion was built, the Weimar Republic about to collapse with Nazism some years later, the crack of 1929, the stock exchange was also about to happen uh, later on in September, this is May, and uh, in Spain, a dictatorship, a first dictatorship, together with a king and a queen ruling. And it's in this context that the pavilion that you're seeing over here with these images is built. It's built in only four months, very, very little time. But finally, it becomes something that stays or stands for only eight months. And afterwards, it disappears. It only stays in the minds of people who had seen it. And Mies van der Rohe explained some years later, what you're seeing over here, uh, that while well, he was already working in Barcelona with these companies that had asked him to prepare the electricity pavilion and the stands to present a series of other uh, products and so on, he received this phone call from the Ministry of the Weimar Republic in which they said, hey, England and France are making their own national pavilion and we also want to have a German pavilion. You're already there, so we want you to build a pavilion. And he said, fine but what is a pavilion? And they answered, we don't know. The only thing we want is that you don't use too much glass, okay? <laughs> and so, well, his answer was, okay, this will be a great possibility. He speaks in German, that's why I'm not kind of showing you the real sound, but if you translate it, it's pretty much that. He used all these different kinds of glass. The pavilion disappeared. It was an important building for the Barcelona of 1929, but then it disappeared. We had a second dictatorship, and during that time, there were a series of people who remembered it. Some young architects, such as Riol Buigas, started to think about the possibility of reconstructing it in the same place. So they exchanged a series of letters, as you're seeing over here, and it seems like Mies van der Rohe accepted the challenge of rebuilding. If there was no other thing that he could build in the city of Barcelona, at least rebuilding it was okay. But he, these letters were from the 50s, 56 and 57. He died in 69, and all this began in 83. The 80s, another Barcelona, after a dictatorship in which there's a lot of enthusiasm in transforming the city, socially, but also architecturally, politically, obviously, economically. And that's when, this is 1980, 
386. The city of Barcelona looked like that. There were many people who were attracted to this kind of old city, which still had that kind of aura or of patina that was not visible in many other cities which had already modernized itself. Of course, infrastructures had to also be taken into account. People were living in Montjuic with these huts, and it was necessary to have a mayor, in this guy is uh, Maragai, previously Narcis Serra, who was there to make a series of projects go forward. And one of them was accepting that the pavilion could be rebuilt, and so a very important building that architects mostly recognized as something which had transformed the way of understanding architecture and the uh, importance that it had had within the city should be built in order to continue uh, understanding and being critical with uh, the new times, with the different elements that transform cities. So, of course, this was also the time in which they were thinking about the possibility of organizing the Olympic Games, which finally took place in 1992. So, many things were going on. At that time, the pavilion had already been rebuilt, and that was finished in 1986. The Olympic Games were being built in different areas, so that Barcelona in 1992 suddenly presented itself to the rest of the world as a city which transformed itself urbanistically, but also socially, through the demands of the different neighbors and the different people that live there. This is an image of the stone, the most important stone we could say of the Barcelona Pavilion, which was the onyx, and which was this big, big kind of achievement about finding it in Algeria, bringing it to Barcelona, and finally being able to finish the last detail, which they were missing before opening it in 1986. And this is the pavilion, the pavilion that nowadays we can visit, that we have photos of, of it in color. They're not uh, only in black and white, but they're actually showing the different textures, the different colors of the glass, of the stones, of the reflections on top of the water, and so on. Very different from images that people had had in mind because of exhibitions on the work of Mies van der Rohe uh, at the Museum of Modern Art. First, there was an exhibition in the 30s about the international style in which the pavilion uh, was also present among other works of other architects of that time, like Alvaralto, Otaut, or so on. And then, after the Second World War, this other exhibition in which it was focusing on the work of Mies van der Rohe. But here you see the Barcelona Pavilion in black and white, difficult to understand all the complexity of the materials, of the reflections, and of the thoughts that there were behind it. So many people had in mind a pavilion that looked like this, because many of the other works that were shown in that exhibition in the 30s at the MoMA were, in fact, whitewashed. Many buildings by Le Corbusier, or Taut, as we were saying before, and so on, were pure whiteness. So the pavilion was rebuilt. But it was rebuilt also with an intention to continuously debate and discuss and continue res researching on what the modern movement had meant, what the pavilion had also uh, meant for the city, but also uh, for the rest of the world, the differences it had brought, how technology had been adapted and uh, brought forward uh, as well as the transformation of space and the creation of new spaces understanding different ways of using materials, structural elements, and the place where buildings are built, which are obviously very important to come up with a project such as this one over here. So this means that once it was rebuilt, the idea was to continue with this research, to continue inviting a series of people, artists, architects, dancers, whatever, who wanted to use this space in order to make some research and bring up different topics, different themes, which could improve a series of debates that we have on our daily lives. And also, the creation of what I'm going to tell you about, and that you can also visit afterwards in the exhibition, which is the creation of not only thinking about the past, but also thinking about the present. And so, the organization of the uh, Mies van der Rohe Award on Contemporary Architecture. What's going on today, and which, were, which are the discussions that are more important day after day? So, well, I'm going to show you this intervention, which took place a couple of years ago now, in which Anna and Eugenie Bach were invited to think about the pavilion. They had this idea of what happens if suddenly the materials kind of disappear or they change, and instead of having the golden onyx, the green alpine marble, 
the also Greek marble or the travertine or the frames of the pieces of glass which are originally chrome steel, now stainless steel. What happens if all these materials are covered with a white surface, white sticker, as you will see right away, and how important are the materials to build up a space? So we were able to slowly start covering the surfaces of the different stones, of the different areas where there's steel, and some major transformations in terms of space, in terms of materiality, in terms of movement through this place started to appear. There were people who started seeing these things on, on Instagram or so on, and they started noticing th some uh, details which they had not noticed before, which were, for example, that the joint that you see over here, the horizontal one, does not coincide, in that case, with the vertical ones. And they started asking or saying, what? Why have you covered it differently than it was originally? But originally, all these kind of non-perfections were part of it. So by adding this layer, the whiteness <coughs> layer, all these details about imperfection, which was very important, like Carl Rougier also spoke about imperfection, Mies van der Rohe, not that much, but we know about the importance that also materiality and handwork and so on had in his uh, work started to appear. Suddenly, the landscape, and we might remember some of his collages in which the surfaces of the different vertical and horizontal plans in his uh, projects and his designs and so on are pretty kind of clear or invisible and suddenly framing a landscape, an image behind is what was really important. And by covering all these surfaces, suddenly you will see how nature suddenly becomes much more important than it might be in some other cases. Here you start seeing the relevance of the trees, the nature that you have around the pavilion. And the same thing happened with people that wear clothes, obviously, different colors, but when the pavilion is not covered with the white uh, stickers that you're seeing over here, you don't notice it that much. But when the pavilion goes white, as you see over here, the presence of people changes. The colors of the glass, this one is gray, for example, there's another one which is green, there's another one which is white, and another one is transparent. Those colors came up, they became much more visible, and so the views through these pieces of glass, how the frames uh, of the landscape and so on were kind of cut and so on, became much more relevant. And also the space changed. The experience of walking through this, even the acoustics and so on, changed a lot. And people wanted to kind of see what was behind. So they started unfolding the stickers to remember and to make sure that behind that sticker there was still travertine, there was still onyx, there was still the different Greek and Italian marbles. But you can see all these imperfections with the joints, which of course are part of the construction, but because of the importance of the detail of having this joint over here, the importance of the textures and of the uh, different uh, colors of the materials and so on, all these details kind of are not as visible as when you cover everything with something like these white sheets that you're seeing over here. And after eight, day, uh, eight days that it was totally covered in white, slowly it came back to its original kind of image which is the one that you all probably uh, recall, and which is the one that I showed in the previous photo. So at, at that time, in 1986, let's say, when the pavilion was rebuilt, and I was saying that together with these interventions, there have been many more and uh, very different, I would say, as well. Um, the Barcelona City Hall, which had also, uh, which was also responsible for this uh, institution, it's a public institution, uh, so they were the ones that brought up the money to rebuild it, but they were also the ones that were really interested in organizing, uh, together with discussions with other architects and so on, uh, an architecture award. An architecture award which would allow to know much more what was going on in other places in Europe. At that time, Europe was very, very different than the one that we have nowadays. Technology was also very, very different. That's sometime, something that you'll see up there 
uh, upstairs in the timeline, but I'll show you also over here. For example, I'm not sure if you start seeing some of the big differences between 1986 and nowadays, once the Mies van der Rohe Award started, started to run. There's some countries which are pretty similar to the ones that we have today, but Germany was split between the western part here in blue and the eastern part. And this island over here is Western Berlin. Okay, so these were the countries that were uh, that participated, let's say, in the first edition, the first cycle of the Mies van der Rohe uh, Award. You also have this huge country over here, this pretty big country, which is Yugoslavia, which does not exist anymore. And now you have uh, different countries such as Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Macedonia, Kosovo, and so on. You have Poland, which was part of the Soviet Union at that time, but Ukraine, for example, was considered part of the Soviet Union, okay? and as well as Armenia and some other countries over there. So, of course, these things have changed, but one of the most important things is that there were borders, and there were also between the different countries. And it was very difficult. It was not that easy. Obviously, there were magazines, but there was no internet. So, creating a debate not only uh, with the other cities from the same country or so on, but kind of extending it further away so that there would be exchange of knowledge and know-how between Barcelona and Berlin, Berlin and Paris, but also Paris and smaller villages in France or smaller villages in France and other ones in the United Kingdom and so on, was very important to understand how cities were transforming. Because many of the, city, many of the countries that appeared after World War uh, II uh, decided to organize this European Union. The aim, the main aim, was not to avoid any future wars. And so, to work together to build up a Europe that would work together, that would facilitate the exchange of uh, technology or economy and so on. And culture was the first one that allowed this connection to exist. And so the European Union, from the very first moment, was already very interested in participating in understanding architecture as this kind of leading uh, field in which we have the responsibility to continuously ask ourselves about things that already exist, that we sometimes think are constant and they've been like that forever, and change them in order to always go forward, improve and change. And so. Uh, also uh, improve like the means of the Roy Pavilion did at that time. So this is a map of the Europe that participates in the award nowadays. We try to understand and to believe that borders do not exist any longer. Fortunately, that is not totally true. There are still borders, although we can kind of travel freely from one country to the other one, or at least in the ones that you see here in gray there are still differences between the different countries. And also, all these laws are the 383 works that participated, that were nominated in the Mies van der Rohe Award in 2019. Because one of the first things that it was decided to do was to create a network, a network of people all over these countries that would uh, be able to know about new buildings, new constructions, transformations, in uh, for structural, infrastructural landscape projects as well, which were happening all over the territory. And so they would deliver this information so that afterwards a jury would be able to kind of judge and decide which projects should be highlighted. So it's important to understand that this price works as a network of architectural institutions all over the continent, experts which are independent and individual, and then also uh, a series of institutions uh, which include the Architecture Council, the Education Council of Europe, and so on. And of course, as I was saying, there's a jury. There's a jury that discusses on all these works that they receive from people who have decided that those projects have to be at least seen by a broader audience. And so, since 1988 till now, 2019, there have been different members uh, forming part of this uh, of these juries. At the beginning, the first two years, you see Kenneth Frampton and some other people, it was the same one, but after that, every two years, because the price takes place every two years, there's a different uh, jury. You start seeing women participating in 2001, before there was, uh, sorry, no, it's true, in 96, it was the first time that there was a woman participating, and slowly and gradually, more women uh, started to be involved, or started being uh, invited. 
but not only that, but also that the juries were not only confirmed by architects, both critics and those that are practicing, but in the last years, we have also invited people who are connected to architecture without being architects. That means clients, clients which are absolutely uh, necessary to go forward with any kind of construction or design, and also politicians who have been involved in decisions uh, regarding urban issues, but also uh, specific decisions on how to grow or how to transform or change uh, infrastructural elements, such as getting rid of cars, uh, mostly in many uh, European city uh, centers. Also sociologists or journalists. And so this mixture of people that in 2019 you'll see upstairs was pretty important, as well as in 2017, brings up a very, very fresh uh, discussion and also a kind of mixture of projects that are finally highlighted by them, which is very interesting and that's what I would like to uh, show you. I said that upstairs there's this timeline. Uh, this one is a little bit different, but in any case, the idea of showing you this is that, of course, the price came already from something that existed from a certain past. We did not want to go past to, to the Roman times or so on. So we stuck to 1929, the construction of this pavilion, uh, the impact that it had in the city of Barcelona, but then also a series of events, of books that were written, of films that uh, were also connected to the city uh, and to uh, how these cities were uh, shaped, also decisions on how the European Union should be uh, formed, the countries that started participating, it was not until 1986, for example, that Spain and Portugal uh, became part of this, uh, of this uh, community of European uh, states. And so uh, there were a series, for example, Ingopro was demolished and that was considered the end of the modern movement and maybe the beginning of the POMO, the post-modernism. Uh, and in fact, the price in 1988 began at a time in which uh, many of the projects, the works of the modern movement were being demolished and there were already institutions that were trying to protect them and to make people realize the importance that they had because of Sometimes, examples such as the pavilion, which had been demolished, but afterwards it had been rebuilt because of a series of values that uh, some people had considered were uh, so important. So taking into consideration that people, inhabitants of cities and villages of uh, everywhere in the territory, had to be involved in this kind of construction of our cities. So here you see a little bit of this kind of before 1986, which uh, what was going on, and uh, in 1988, as I said, once the pavilion was reopened, there were a series of projects which were very important and which had a big impact, such as the Pompidou uh, in uh, France, in Paris, Kenneth Frampton writing modern architecture, and so also kind of uh, making a series of uh, catalog. catalog uh, groupings of how architecture could be organized uh, in the 20th century uh, and putting it kind of in a very rational uh, way. The flag of Europe, that nowadays we consider it like something that has existed forever, but it was not used until 1986. And then finally, the first jury deciding that the first project to be awarded the prize was a project by Alvaro Siza, who afterwards would become very important. But there's also some political decisions. Here you have that word that it said over there, which was the Erasmus program. The Erasmus program was a decision by the European uh, institutions to make it easier for students from one city or from one country to continue their studies, at least for a year, in another university in Europe, which would allow uh, a better understanding of uh, how the uh, pedagogical systems work and it also started, in fact, making them a little bit more homogeneous, although, of course, there's always differences. Important events happened in some countries. In 1992, the Barcelona Olympic Games transformed the city. In that case, the jury considered that one of the buildings was to win the, the award. But also, construction of infrastructures 
For example, this tunnel that connected Paris and London, Paris and Brussels and London. And so that meant that it was easier and faster to go from one city to the other, from one country to the other, but it was also necessary to build a series of building of train stations and so on, like Grimshaw's um, Waterloo uh, Terminal. With the opening of an agreement that was called Schengen, which meant that the borders between countries started disappearing, it was also possible for low-cost companies such as EasyJet that we just saw over there to start running between these cities and making cheaper prices or uh, making it possible for everybody to travel from one country to the other to visit places. It was not necessary to see it through television. Now there was already internet or images, but it was possible to actually go to places and visit them. And so this started growing. And nowadays, of course, we're trying to go back and understand that, of course, uh, so many people traveling constantly with airplanes and so on also has a negative aspect. And so obviously these things have to be rethought. But the construction of airports and not only airports which are beautiful or nice or so on, but as the one that we saw before by Norman Foster, which became kind of um, basic uh, airport modulations which could be applied all over the world. And so many uh, airports, at least built in Europe, followed the system that uh, Norman Foster projected or designed for the Stansted Airport in London were very important. Or we'll also see that Zaha Hadid won the prize with a parking lot. A parking lot that was meant to gather all the cars of people in Strasbourg, in France, where there's a lot of the European institutions, to uh, maybe a drive by car to the city, leave the car on the outskirts, and then take all the public system to avoid collapsing the city center with cars. So infrastructural elements, infrastructural buildings, together with obviously other projects which were more kind of individual elements. Also the importance of heritage, and that's something that started already in around the years 2000s and so on. There we see that building over there, which was the Neues Museum by David Chipperfield. It's a museum that had been destroyed during World War II, and it was not until 2011 that finally they reopened it. It was this big discussion on what to do with heritage. It's time there are more and more elements which exist and which can be transformed instead of tearing them down. And so different ways of interventions in these existing contexts were obviously also very important and taken into account. And if you go afterwards upstairs, you'll see that many projects deal with heritage. In fact, they deal with heritage in such a way that heritage has become kind of a language in itself, which means that sometimes, even if things do not exist, if there are no kind of pre-existences, the way some architects, like H architects, Ak architectas, but also uh, some others, they create from scratch new buildings, but with this image, uh, image, imagery or so on of uh, heritage, of patina, of constructing with traditional materials such as brick and stone and so on, but uh, even reusing the materials. Okay, this video was not working, uh, but uh, what it tried to do over here was this research project that we kind of intend, uh, that we did with the European Commission, which was uh, visiting 16 studios of architecture, it's online, uh, so you can always see it, this was a short trailer. Because something that the European Commission or the European institutions were really interested in was saying, hey, after all these years, nearly 30 years at that time, this was three years ago, is there such a thing as a European identity? Or are we still considering each one of us as having our own identity? Is that positive, that there's a European identity together with a local identity of each city, each uh, region, or so on? And so we started asking uh, architects to understand how they understood this issue of ident identity. Sometimes it's not exactly identity, depending on where the words have to change because they're not understood in the same way. But sometimes it's attitudes, attitudes towards a series of, um, uh, of topics or uh, of, of, of uh, of, yeah, of topics, I would say. So this means that we asked all these people, because in fact I have some students, as we were saying before, in, in Barcelona who come from the United States. And some of them told me, oh, this is so European. 
uh, there in Barcelona, when we travel to the Netherlands or so on, and I try to ask them, what does that mean? What is it that it makes this building or this public space or so on that European? And it was an interesting discussion, but I really didn't catch it that much. So it was also interesting to understand how people understood this kind of image that sometimes from outside Europe people have of something being European, and that when you live there, when you're from there, it's difficult to grasp. And most of them spoke about all these differences that exist from city to city, uh, from region to region, which make up finally an identity because of all these differences and the richness through different languages because of uh, different uh, cultural backgrounds and also, of course, because of acquiring uh, or receiving uh, each time more and more people from all over uh, the world. We also have to understand that uh, mo many European cities are very, very dense places. One, well, the most dense area in Europe is in Barcelona, in the metropolitan uh, area, and it has 53,000 inhabitants per square kilometer, which is really, really uh, very, very big. And so, of course, that's a way to understand the city and the relationship between people and how commercial buildings uh, interact with uh, office buildings, with housing and so on, which is different from places in which the density is much lower. So some of the aspects that appear were the importance, for example, of public space, but public space is also different in the Nordic countries where it's normally cold, so it's something that you might see from a window while you're warm, but they have uh, an actual importance as well as a separation between a neighbor, a building, and another one, or public space in southern countries, which are all the time uh, occupied and used Throughout the, throughout the year. The importance of competitions, public competitions, which have allowed not only the construction of very interesting uh, and experimental buildings, but what we see through this archive that I will show you right away is that each time there are more private clients who also promote competitions in order to decide uh, how to go forward with the construction of their headquarters or of a private hospital or whatever. And this has also increased the quality of a, a, gen a more general or a broader amount of buildings throughout all these uh, cities. So, with all this information, at that time there were, uh, in, nine, in 2016, uh, the price had kind of gathered 2,800 uh, projects uh, nominated by all this kind of network of people and institutions and so on, but it had become kind of an archive, a series of folders with information on all these projects, and they were categorized, as you see a little bit over here, by their programs, all their religious projects together, all the sports projects together and so on. But we decided to start checking uh, what they could explain, they, if they explained anything what they meant, how they could be kind of explaining this transformation of the city, but also the transformation of architectural offices. At the very beginning, for example, architecture schools in the 1980s were very important and they kind of created a certain path or um, way of doing that could be recognized. So the Porto School in Portugal was very strong. Then the Delft School in the Netherlands also became very strong and you could see students that had kind of studied with a series of professors and following uh, specific ways of understanding architecture, uh, materials, construction methods, and so on. Uh, but once all this mixture of students from one uh, city studying in several universities all over, these things started kind of disappearing. And so through this atlas that was published, I think you have it in, the, in your library in fact, um, there were a series of diagrams and schemes and also texts that uh, were brought that brought together a series of not conclusions. I would not say that they were uh, in fact conclusions, but graphics which showed that, for example, uh, many architects that at the beginning worked in their regions, in their cities, but did not go abroad. Slowly throughout the years, each time had more work, more projects to build uh, outside their uh, the cities where they had their offices. Also, smaller offices uh, existed at the very beginning and throughout the years, bigger offices uh, were created. Created, but also through the crisis, these bigger offices, some of them had a worse time, had a hard time to continue 
with their uh, work, and it was the smaller ones in some countries which were the ones that survived. How the scale of the projects uh, they could be compared, but not only through scale, but also where they were built. For many years, it was the central part of the cities, the historic part of the cities, where these important, interesting, and high-quality buildings were built. But once, it seemed like all these centers had already been uh, redesigned, rethought, rebuilt, and so on, slowly, this new construction with these new buildings and so on started stretching and appearing in the outskirts of the city, but also in areas of landscape and so on. So nowadays there's around 3,500 projects that have been kind of always brought together. There's all these folders uh, which have all the information on all these uh, around 3,500 projects. This is the physical uh, so this is the physical archive, but it also exists online and it uh, allows anybody to just uh, use it in order to study it, research it, and find conclusions of their own. But uh, from the very beginning, it also created a collection of models, a collection of models by some of the architects that were highlighted by the juries who donate every two years these models to uh, the price, to this European uh, institution. Price, and that allows uh, the organization of a series of exhibitions or discussions or debates. And I repeat, not only in Europe, but also elsewhere in China, but here in the States as well. And not only to professionals in Latin languages, there's this difference between uh, disseminating, would be the word in English, but which would be divulgare, which is more kind of uh, explaining to a general audience a series of concepts that we can discuss in architecture, but then also uh, the seminare, which would be to create this discussion among professionals in which the uh, discussion can go uh, in other ways. So here, for example, you see how some of this archive is brought out to the streets, sometimes with models as well, but in this case with images and explaining a series of projects built all over Europe. Here, for example, this was a very simple kind of exhibition in which the form of the European map is made up We're using the different models and locating them or putting them exact, well, exactly in the cities where they were originally built. Or in this case, this was an exhibition that the Spanish government wanted to do, so specifically focusing on all the Spanish projects that had been nominated and understanding how Spanish architecture had evolved since the 80s and also not only through drawings, there are, um, the collection also has drawings, so together with the models and so on, but a timeline, okay, a timeline specifically uh, done and connected to Spanish episodes or historic episodes. And now we come to 2019. This has been the last award that has been organized in which the chairwoman was Dorte Mandra from Copenhagen, from uh, Denmark, together with six other uh, people, George Arbit from Beirut, Lebanon, also uh, Frank McDonald, who's a journalist from Ireland, and then we also had Camille Classe, an architect from NL Architects uh, in Amsterdam, Maria Langarita, an architect, a young architect from uh, Madrid, uh, Langarita Navarro is the name of the, of the firm, Angelica Fitz, she is a curator, she's not an architect, but she is now the director of the Architecture Zentrum in uh, Vienna, and um, I guess I'm missing somebody, but well, I'll see right away who it is. And what they are asked is that, for example, this year, as I said, they received 383 proposals of works that several people, a group of around 100 people considered were really important to be seen, to be discussed, to be uh, kind of in the discussion about what had happened, what has happened in the last two years in, uh, in European architecture. From there, they meet, and there's this discussion, there's this debate, uh, which, on goes, uh, which goes on for uh, around three days, in which they meet in Barcelona, and they have a series of panels and folders where they can see all the information, videos, photographs, texts, and so on. And they have to make a short list of 40 works, 40 works which are the ones that are shown in exhibitions, and then 10 of them you can see also in the exhibition and which deal with many different topics. So it can have to do with, for example, heritage issue that we were speaking about before, but also different kinds of programs. Uh, and from these 40, they choose five 
which are the ones that they are able to visit. We still understand the importance of visiting, touching, and also speaking to those people that are working or living in some of these places, but also the neighbors, uh, the ones that live near to these buildings, but also the ones that live in cities. Okay, so having as much information as possible for the jury to understand, well, how that uh, building, how that space has an impact, positive, negative, all these kind of uh, issues. Uh, into or with the with the community and so these are the five together with uh, another one which is the emerging uh, winner which are visited and finally from there they decide who is the winner so we film all these things and I'll show you short videos of the of the different buildings this is first some uh, short video a trailer of the discussions of the jury nobody members. can say oh, you have to make an objective judgment. There is no such thing. You put us in a tough situation, but I'm happy and honored to be part of this. We are not talking about style. We are not talking about taste. It's always more than that. It might happen. Maybe the best one might remain undiscovered in the end. In the process of, of visiting the different projects, what happens is that you change your mind. There's somehow a new agenda in the project that we've chosen. It's about unprogrammed space. In all of them, there is a paradigm shift. None of them is the answer that is expected, I have to say. It's very communicative and open and welcoming. Yes, it's, it's very uh, it's happy. The dreamlike quality of the space was amazing. Very original in the use of color in space. So it's like a three-dimensional painting you're moving around. How well is display the materials? No, it looks like a piece of art. Yeah, it's really about uh, the essential elements of architecture and decomposing and recomposing them. And I think it's a discourse about space. It's a lesson about architecture, I think. I thought it was so Berlin that this fulfills kind of an aspiration by a certain category of people who want to be in something weird and wonderful. It's very much a sculpture also, telling us that architecture can be a building, it can be landscape and it can be a street. This is a grand gesture which is a space and which is not an authoritarian gesture but a healing gesture for the city. I kept looking at the people and I saw them disappear while they were still in the square, I thought, what a beautiful spatial device. It's very simple. This pyramid for me was a revelation. It is one of those buildings that once they appear, it changes completely the possibilities of architecture. I just think this is what architecture should be about, transforming people's lives for the better. It's really about human dignity, so for me it was really touching. And you do it while everyone is still living there. How brilliant is that? I, I'm sure that all of us has like two or three favorites. Let's get them on the table. Situation is extremely interesting. If we stick to the bold calculation, Bordeaux is the winner so far. Unless somebody wants to put their vote again into question. Say it now or shut up forever. Sorry for the word. This is Bordeaux, finish, okay. I forgot Stephen Ginculescu, who's the direct, he's an architect from Romania, from Bucharest, and he's also the director of a magazine. Um, but you see how difficult it is to judge your partners, your friends' uh, work, and how difficult we know that it is to build anything, and how uh, much time consuming it is, and how uh, really uh, engaged you are with, uh, we all are with the, those things that get built, and how difficult it is to really end up a project as you would have liked it to, uh, to be. So the discussions are not easy and it's not that from the very beginning they know which one is going to win and that's what's interesting, that's what makes these discussions and presenting it here and worldwide uh, really interesting to see what's going on in the discussions some of the discussions, uh, in this case through uh, this case of the, of the Mies uh, Award. But you also saw that the five words plus this one might look very very different. But, uh, we go back to the images, we'll see now. Okay, there's this public square, there's this other kind of public space, we could say, housing. This is kind of an 
arts and housing uh, project in Berlin or the Placentia, more kind of UFO kind of building. But at the same time, what's really interesting is that there are many things in common, but they're not really visible at first glance. You have to kind of read, you have to kind of start diving a little bit into each one of these projects to understand that something which is very important is that each one gives a lot of possibilities to those that use it. So it has, these have all been projects that were built during the really tough crisis in, uh, in Europe as well as in many other uh, places and in which sometimes the budgets uh, kind of moved and changed uh, all the time. But in any case, without kind of only focusing on budget issues, uh, sometimes the program, uh, from the client's point of view, was not that clear either. They knew that they needed a space like a convention center or a, a congress center, but this is Placentia, a place where it's difficult to attract people to go there and discuss on all kinds of things and have a huge auditorium like they have it. So this building had to give something back to the city, which was not only for those people that would come for a day or two and then leave. It should also become a place with all kinds of possibilities for activities for the city. And we'll also see how this is also true in all the other uh, projects. This is the one of the emerging architects that will, who will be here, Bast, uh, from Toulouse. They have their office. And this is a village uh, in the Pyrenees, so a little bit southwards from Toulouse, um, which is a very small village. And they have this public school. And they needed a place for the kids to eat, the canteen. And so they came up with this project. C'est une cantine. <rire> et euh, elle est mieux que la dernière. Et elle est beaucoup plus grande. Enfin, elle est plus grande. Ouais, plus grande. Elle est un peu plus jolie. La cousine, ça, c'est le salon. Quand cette cantine a été construite, et tout le monde parlait, on va avoir une nouvelle cantine. On est très content de ce nouvel espace avec la lumière, c'est très joli. Notre animatrice nous a dit que notre cantine avait gagné un prix parce qu'elle était, euh, je sais pas, était jolie ou je sais pas pourquoi elle a gagné un prix. These are short, short versions of these videos that you can see up, uh, in the exhibition uh, space. But what you see is that a very simple project, which this it's this extension to the existing uh, school, has also a very important urban uh, kind of impact. There's the, the patio, let's say, on the other side, but they decided to build this extensive, this very narrow uh, building that you see over here with this big glazing uh, part on both sides so that visually you continue seeing from uh, the, the space uh, behind the uh, fields of the village because when you're in this village, you, it's very small, it's a really beautiful place and a beautiful landscape all around it. You see it all the time and so they wanted to kind of preserve this view through the canteen and towards uh, the landscape uh, around it. Also using prefabricated elements, all the wooden elements that you were seeing, the structural elements were built in the factory, brought here <laughs> and brought together, built up over, uh, over there in this, uh, in this place. Let's go to this other building. This is by Randall Huber, a uh, very interesting, obviously, uh, firm uh, office from uh, Berlin and what's really important over here is also the role of the client. It's not that the client asked uh, the architects to build uh, something very specific with a very specific program or so on, but they participated in all the discussions. Let's first listen to the two clients and also to Randall Cooper. Everything is an experiment. Artists. It's all new. This type of building is breaking barriers on many levels. Just by the typology, you produce a heterogeneity in use. Ecological, creative, women, or dogs. I think we had also a criteria of dogs or animal friendly. You have this whole circulation where everybody is meeting each other like completely naturally. It's not about design and looks. It's just about space. So in this concrete building, they were working with these very narrow, very long spaces that you see over here. Each one uh, on the ground floor, it's really, really long and 
areas which are pretty dark in, in the central parts, but this also happens on the top ones because they can't deliver towards the other side on top of the street, which makes some of these spaces uninhabitable, uh, uninhabitable so they are not possible uh, spaces to live in, but they are places where you can, for example, sleep at night if you are, there's an architecture office, there are many artist places and so on, so sometimes you have to stay at work uh, uh, overnight and all that, so that's possible, but some spaces are not as long and those are the ones that have become housing and where, for example, the owners also live. And the owners are imagining this in 15 years full of plans, and for example, these uh, balconies that you see over here are spaces which connect the different people which are using the spaces behind these pieces of glass over here and so they have the space to uh, interact among them and also to go upstairs and also visit the neighbors or the people over there but also as important as these spaces this is all private but everybody can go in through a restaurant and so on, is this inner court, inner patio, where neighbors during the day can go inside and there's different animals and uh, children love to come and feed them. And there's also places where they kind of grow uh, different kinds of, of food. Let's see, this one by uh, Selgascano, an office from Madrid. El aspecto que tiene por fuera siempre decimos, parece un invernadero, ¿qué será? No sabemos exactamente qué, qué es. Me ha llamado muchísimo la atención y he visto una cosa tan rara que no lo había visto nunca, la verdad. Era simplemente coger el programa que nos dio la Junta, todas las funciones una encima de otra, apiñadas, al límite y compactadas al límite. Y eso te da una forma que nunca nos ha preocupado. Es un edificio muy masivo en el fondo, pero le da la sensación que es algo que podría salir volando en cualquier momento, ¿no? que es como una burbuja que se ha posado y que podría desaparecer. So the importance of this uh, project, and I think we can see it here, is that Placencia is a town with a beautiful church and a castle and all that, but in the last 40, 50 years it has grown like you're seeing over here. You see this is the natural landscape that it has with a certain topography and so on, and what they have been doing uh, during all these years is just filling it up, uh, making a horizontal platform, on top of which they're building all these kind of not interesting and pretty ugly kind of buildings, and the city is growing like that. And the idea was that this should continue over here. And so all this should disappear, it should be filled in with ground, and then more buildings such as these had to be built. The crisis stopped this kind of unending uh, growth of the city, but they saw the possibility of finding some funding to build a congress center. And so the, this was a competition, and what the architects did was touch as little as possible the ground. And also, when touching the ground, touch the natural ground. And also, not only building the, the construction that you see over here, but also making a perimeter all around it, which is part of the building. It's part of this project that you're seeing over here, and which cannot be changed ever at all which means that even if they continue growing like they've done over here, there will be this crater in this area, which will always remind people of the natural topography of the area. So even if we hope that this does not continue happening all over and around this building, how these subtle kind of movements and decisions are also kind of preserving, in this case, part of the natural surroundings of the city of Placentia. And the Skanderbeg Square in yeah, the square is obviously a physical space, but there's a lot of symbolic value. If you experience it every day, it also becomes part of your mental map. And in that sense, it's also a very political project. This renovation is also an expression of our renovation of the country. We went out of the dark. It's like a huge operation at the heart of the city. So in a way, it's also to some extent an operation in the heart of the people. So there's also a very subtle decision over here, which is also very, very important. This is not totally flat. 
it becomes kind of a pyramid with a higher point in the center uh, of, the, of the square. And uh, this allows for a very important change in terms of the perception of people in the space surrounded by all the buildings that you somehow see over here. Many of these buildings were built, uh, or all of them were built during the dictatorship, the last dictatorship that they had over here, although there's some older buildings as well. And they were all built as uh, imperialist, we could say, or monumental buildings that tried to make people kind of feel small and always kind of worried about what was happening inside those political, let's say, uh, institutions or elements. And uh, by changing that and making it higher in the central point, suddenly the relationship that people have when crossing this plaza and so on with the buildings around it has changed. And it's difficult to express it or to explain it, but it really happens. And there's also some nice images of people who are walking and crossing, and suddenly you see them get up to the highest point, and then suddenly disappear as they are walking uh, along the other side and going into the really chaotic city of Tirana, which is full of cars. It's a city which, during the dictatorship, it had banned people from having cars. But once the dictatorship stopped, everybody started buying cars, and it became the most chaotic city, I would say, in uh, Europe. So this becomes an oasis in which people have space to enjoy themselves. And it's not only the stone part, but also the green parks, which connect with the existing buildings and so on, are also very important. You'll see that much better in the videos and the exhibition space. Another very interesting project, one of the five finalists as well, is this psychiatric center. People are still not sure the here in the Vita clinic. Group. What this building is meant for, what it, what it should be used for. When I saw the maquette and I saw there was no roof, no windows, I thought, oh, what the hell, that's got to be the building without a roof. So I was a bit skeptical at the beginning. When a psychiatric hospital is too clinical, then it doesn't work. If you ask me what is the definition and function of this building, well, it's a space of possibilities where it is the patient, the visitor, the, the, the co-worker who uses it, who defines this space. So here we see, again, this kind of tendency for many years of demolishing. And now we'll see the one in Bordeaux, the winner, by um, La Caton Vassal, in which this kind of obsession on demol demolishing and building, uh, again, from scratch, is not always the best decision. Um, and in this case, this building, had all, they had already started demolishing, uh, demolishing it. And the idea of the previous architect was to continue demolishing all these buildings and build new facilities, new hospital facilities, which would kind of, uh, well, be more, uh, would follow the code or they would kind of be more updated in terms of uh, somehow some kind of uh, psychological or psychiatrical uh, treatment. But uh, the new director, as he was saying, the CEO, when he arrived, he stopped the demolition and started just thinking about which possibilities this building and all the others still had. Even if it could not be used directly as a place where uh, the, uh, the, the patients uh, that are living here could kind of sleep or could kind of have uh, spaces with their doctors or whatever. And so that's when he spoke with Gideon, who was also speaking in this video, and they started thinking of uh, making a project which would bring together all the different ideas and thoughts about the people working here. This means the doctors, the uh, nurses, the patients. And so uh, listening to them, in order to afterwards organize a competition with different architects and finally come up with a final solution. And so one of the big thing, one of the important things is that some psychiatrical uh, patients uh, do not or cannot stand being in empty void spaces. So if the idea was to demolish this and just leave a big green grass uh, space, it would not work for many of the people over here. But instead, if they felt themselves kind of safe because there were walls there were kind of corners and so on, it could help in their treatment uh, while they were living here in some of the other buildings. And so this is a building that is not totally finished. Of course, the first thing that you think about is some of them trying to commit suicide from the second floor or so on. And these are things that happen. But there is a continuous kind of process in which 
when these things happen, there are discussions and uh, debates between uh, the patients and the doctors and so on in order to decide what to do, which means we have to kind of put plastic elements on the windows because this should not happen again, or this is something that happens and what we have to try is to decide that, uh, to see how we can prevent it uh, using uh, other systems, speaking and so on. And if there are kind of situations such as these ones, kind of accept them or understand that they might happen. So slowly, uh, parts of the building might be covered, parts of the different floors might be open to everyone, slowly, and so the process will continue kind of developing. And this is the last uh, project, the winner, which is these massive housing, which you find absolutely everywhere in the world, uh, which were also supposed to be demolished. And not only was it not demolished, but it now became also part of the UNESCO Bordeaux area. And so uh, these buildings also from the 60s, which looked like this, okay, um, had to be transformed. But they had to be transformed because, of course, it was cold or hot inside, they needed insulation, they are very, very, very small. And so most of them, and you might have heard about cases in, in London or so on, or sometimes just cladded with aluminum kind of uh, pieces and some thermal insulation and so on. And well, supposedly that already improves the conditions of the people living inside. But what's really interesting that is, is that in this case, what they uh, achieved was to transform the facade that you see over here by adding surface, by adding volume, so giving more to the inhabitants of these buildings, by building this gallery that you're seeing over here, you already insulate the uh, part of the building in which they have their bedrooms, their kitchens, and so on. And uh, so you don't need uh, other materials to solve that. Um, and in the end, it improves the uh, living conditions of the people uh, from this place. But you'll, you'll hear them better here in the video. These are 530 houses. And you see the it's first really the act of sustainability is this. not to demolish what is not at the end of the life. The question is, is to make good housing at an affordable price. This project brings new quality of use for the, the inhabitants. If you want to be generous, you can, with low money. It's interesting to have low money because we have to... To think. You have to think, it's so blind. And to say that we are happy. We are babies, we are happy. We are very happy people. And today it's super. The champagne. <laughs> so the inhabitants are really happy, but for the price of building a new building, uh, for the price of building one apartment, here they have been able to refurbish and to improve with the same conditions as a new one, three of them. Okay? So for a long time, this is not just kind of a nice idea that they had. This has been research that has been ongoing with, uh, it's called Research Plus, uh, for more than 15 years, in which they have been testing this, also in Paris, for example, and trying to understand that these constructions have many qualities, because the concrete is still in good conditions, and because the construction is, uh, is good enough, and because there are many things that can be solved in other ways, which always as he said, with less money, it can allow the people over here to continue living in their same apartment. That's something that people who uh, are already a bit old, they don't want to move. So they did not have to move from their apartment, even during construction. They just had to kind of close the windows with plastics and so on for, uh, I think it was two days maximum, so that they could add this prefabricated element. They could open up some of the windows, which were smaller in the existing facade, so that they would become big uh, holes uh, connecting to the balcony over there and then paint it and then move on to the next one so that the neighbor could start colonizing and each one does it very differently there's some people who put plants all over and open the blinds and are all the day looking at the fantastic views to the river to Bordeaux and so on there's other people because of their cultural background and so on that put the sofa uh, giving it back to the views and they just look at their own kind of spaces to their own bedrooms and kitchen and so on but well that's what this was about, about uh, giving these people extra space, extra surface, same cost, same money that they paid before. This is social housing. 
and then using it uh, as they prefer. Of course, all these things have to be discussed. It's nice when we go there and we listen to these people and they explain it. It's also nice to have uh, lectures. Obviously, uh, so we did invite them for the ceremony to all these six uh, teams of really interesting architects to explain their work, but we told them, okay, we've already seen many things online and we've already seen you with lectures and so on, so we give you 10 minutes, and in 10 minutes we want you to explain your project, okay, so really summarizing as much as possible, because what we were really interested was, in this case, and it's not always the case, was to have a discussion among the clients, to understand the relationship that clients had with architects and how they saw arch uh, the role of architecture, or what architecture could also uh, kind of understand from the needs of the clients. So here you have the one from PC Caritas, also Gideon, and the two um, clients from the German uh, from the German building, and then we did another round table with the, with the other client. So understanding that all these people which are involved in the project are really interesting, and this made this debate, this discussion, really, really kind of uh, passionate and interesting. And it was done in this context of the exhibition. An exhibition, a format of which you will see over here, because it's not easy to transport models and it's expensive and it's not always necessary, but trying to explain these projects to anybody who was uh, interested. We also brought the chairs from all these six projects, so uh, furniture was very important this time we, uh, we saw. Uh, sometimes it was designed especially for, uh, for each one of these spaces. Sometimes they had decided which existing furniture, like Mies van der Roy had done in the Barcelona pavilion, in which he was looking for an existing chair to put into that pavilion. He could not find anything, and that's when, together with Lili Reik, they, uh, they designed the Barcelona chair, which is supposed to be for the king, was supposed to be for the king and the queen, although they never sat on them. Okay, but it was an excuse to design furniture, and still that happens. For example, in the Skanderberg Square, and returning to the pavilion, suddenly this pavilion which had had in use, a representative use in 1929, which was rebuilt to continue this discussion and uh, debate on architecture uh, today, also becomes, as it was in 1929, a stage. A stage upon which, in this case, with Dorothy Mandrup and uh, representatives from the City Hall and the European institutions and so on, uh, can explain and can uh, collect the price and can say some words to all this network of people that I was telling you at the beginning that make the uh, praise uh, possible. These are the people from Bast, from Toulouse, that you will be having here uh, in a short time. And as well as the pavilion becomes this platform, representation pavilion, uh, platform again, uh, the Venice Biennale, as well as other uh, Biennales all over the world, also allows us to present uh, another category of the price, which is for final degree projects. So we were interested not only in the build part, in those young architects or uh, established architects that have built a building and that you can visit it, but also what the different schools all over Europe, to start with, were doing with their students, with the educational programs. And so this is also kind of collected and another jury I'm not going to kind of go over it too much, also analyzes and allows us to discuss on uh, the themes or the topics that the different schools are discussing on. And just an example of one of the winners from last year, which was also uh, reviewing uh, some of the underground structures of Madrid and how they could be reused in contemporary Madrid. So both the way of presenting the images, the way of representing, I mean, communicating, drawing, and uh, understanding spaces and constructing are somehow summarized in videos such as the one that you're seeing over here. So, well, that's not the best way to finish. Uh, but in any case, well, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah.
questions or to continue a little bit of the discussion before we go upstairs. the nominations, they don't pick the nominations. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there's a really interesting kind of dynamic between, uh, you know, what, the, you know, how these projects come about, and it, and it really, it's representative in, in just the, like, extreme difference of the finalists, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it goes from a, a kind of, you know, very formally driven project to a, to a, to a plaza. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the dynamic between those sure. three parts of the jury, the mission of the prop program in general, hmm. the nominators, and then the jury itself. Yeah. What it, the main aim is to make the process as transparent as possible. So that's why the videos are online and we try to show, of course there's sometimes discussions which are better not to kind of make public, but that the process has to be as transparent as possible. To make that possible, you need like different uh, uh, different people, different actors participating in it so that it is not only like the same people who are part of the jury who are the ones deciding which projects they think are interesting and necessary to have there. And then this also makes this kind of network of experts uh, change every two, four years. So uh, what we do is that there's a series of people from each one of the countries. We discuss with the institutions in each one of the countries who they think could be interesting, but we also do research uh, through texts uh, on blogs or magazines on people that we see have written interesting things or are there really discussing about what's happening in, in a certain region or a certain uh, city or so on. And well, this kind of uh, changing and uh, also asking them to write a short text on why they are, uh, why they propose that building to, uh, to be there uh, is very important to kind of continue with those people the following time, the following cycle, or to change them. And, um, and that allows uh, the jury sometimes to uh, receive a series of projects which most of them they know. We tried not to forget any interesting project and that is done after all these nominators send their, their proposals and so on, uh, there's an advisory committee, which are the directors of all the architecture museums in Europe, uh, we meet, and uh, 20 more projects can be added. So the problem sometimes is that somebody thinks, uh, okay, this Zaha Hadid project, everybody will nominate it, so I'm not nominating it. And finally, nobody does that. Okay. So that's when the advisory committee has the possibility of adding some projects that maybe have been left out. Okay. But it, the jury cannot add any other projects. So if something has been left out, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay like that. And so the jury comes in at another kind of moment. It's true that there's one member from the advisory committee every time. So Angelica Fitz, the director of the Vienna Architecture Center, she... Well, no, she's not allowed to be in the discussion in which 20 buildings are added because she's already in the jury. But, well, she knows how uh, the process works, and so that also helps sometimes the jury understand all the different uh, procedures. Um, what else? Um, so the main goal is to kind of not forget anything, uh, to have things which are nearly not known by anybody, they have not been published, that's why they have to be local and we're not interested in having everybody from Paris, all the nominators from Paris. We try to have somebody from Paris, somebody from Toulouse, somebody from Bordeaux, so that it's not, nothing escapes uh, this kind of overview. And, uh, and, and obviously there are things that personally each one of us involved and also you uh, might think uh, you don't like it at all, it has no interest and that happens, uh, or why has somebody nominated this, 
Uh, but this is also important. These are buildings that we know this year there were 383. Okay? They show something which is happening in Europe, okay? but they're not showing obviously all the constructions that are taking place in Europe. Most of the projects that are built uh, have very little interest. They're not really giving uh, any extra kind of thinking in, uh, in architecture. Some of these sometimes enter the process, but many of them kind of disappear. So we have to be aware that these are kind of uh, highlighting projects built in Europe, but it's not the, it's maybe a 10% of what's really built. And it's true that we don't discuss, we discuss about it, but we don't show this 90% of daily construction. I'm not sure if that answered yeah, part of it. Yeah, I think it's true that for four of the projects, they were kind of made, uh, the people that used them or lived in them made them their own uh, very directly. In Placentia, it's where, well, you already saw some of the comments, and if you watch the videos upstairs, you'll even see, like, some of them said, what's this, why are... And they have had to do a very uh, important effort to uh, invite everybody from the region, from Extremadura in this case, uh, from kids in schools to everybody else, uh, inviting them through guided tours and so on, explaining the project. And once they see that there's something else than just the skin that they see from the highway or from inside and so on, and they start appreciating it. So there's this very important process of also kind of, kind of uh, explaining things and making people understand that architecture is not only about the envelope or about the visual part. And the other thing that I think I'm very happy with that part is that we have the European Union supporting economically half of the cost of the, of the whole process of the, of the price. Um, but they also understand that through the different discussions that take place over here, policies can be kind of brought forward. So they have finally understood that architecture has a role uh, in citizens' uh, daily life. Right? It's a right that uh, as citizens of Europe or whatever uh, we have, and they are taking that very seriously. And so in the next years, uh, architecture will be uh, will have a very strong presence in part of their political discussion or debate. And it also is interesting to see how some of these politicians or people who are not architects but they work in these political institutions uh, are interested in knowing more and are then also spreading somehow what they have seen or learned by being close to this. So, for example, last time, two years ago, the winner was also housing. 
it was a different project by uh, NL uh, Architects. But before that, there had been many projects, the winners, when we saw it a little bit in the timeline, they were all cultural buildings, auditoriums, museums, and cultural centers all over, which were great, uh, very interesting, and so on. But suddenly after that, a housing block from the 60s, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, which is ugly, which uh, is huge, which reminds us of the past, suddenly wins the price. And when I was on the phone with them, they kind of said, oh, that one. Uh, people from communicate, communication, they said, send me photos. No, 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 I want nicer photos. And I said, these are the photos that there are. But you have to read, you have to make a little bit more of an effort to understand why that has been important. In that case, uh, it achieved uh, a possibility of having cheaper housing in Amsterdam, which is very expensive, uh, by transforming it in a very radical and simple, uh, well, very Dutch way of, uh, of going forward with, uh, with the project. And then, Michel Magnier, uh, who was responsible for this program, Creative Europe, the European Commission, during the ceremony, he spoke about that. That first he had been shocked, but then he started understanding the importance of what that housing and that transformation had in transforming not only the lives of those people, but also the, that uh, neighborhood and the whole city of Amsterdam through uh, infrastructural elements and so on. So, I mean, these are small steps but which become kind of very important in order to not only have the people who are living there understand, like that woman, she's really happy with her dog and so on, and she wants to have some pine with everybody, uh, but also, uh, well, those people that were involved, the mayor of Bordeaux or the broader metropolitan uh, area. So, so yeah, it's not only those people that live there that make it themselves, but um, their own, but also, uh, from other places which sometimes you would think they don't care that much or are not there when they should. Yeah, um, it's true that, let's, with the second part, uh, for many years the winners were Zaha Hadid, Norman Foster, Ram Kolha, so star architecture and star architects uh, were there. They were in the news, but they were also present in the prize. Uh, but sometimes with projects that were not the most famous project, when Zaha Hadid uh, built a parking garage, it's maybe not the project that everybody has in mind at all. They were non-minor projects, but more subtle kind of uh, designs. Uh, so that is something that appears and that you understand in the, in the timeline. Then something which uh, in Europe has been very, very important and continues being very important has been uh, what to do with the pre-existing, with heritage. So we already saw that with uh, Chipperfield's transformation of the, of the, um, of the Neues Museum in, uh, in Berlin, but that brought the politicians, not only that, but also other kind of policies that they were discussing on, so on, to organize in 2018 the European Year of Cultural Heritage. So to really focus on what heritage, cultural heritage meant and uh, what, what impact it had on, on citizens. But then also not only understanding the importance of that heritage, which most people understand that building from the past century is really nice and it should be kept there because it's part of our identity of uh, local uh, Berlin identity but also broader German and maybe European but then making a step forward and understanding that all this other architecture this post-war housing blocks are also part of our heritage even if it's more recent it's more difficult to understand that that has a certain uh, an interest and that for example if we tear that down it's impossible nowadays in Europe to build a block as huge as the one that won two years ago. That one is 700 meters long, if I'm not wrong. And it was, now I'm changing subject, but the Chinese came because they were interested. This was one of the blocks, but there were like 21 like those when they were built. The Queen, Patrick, no, the Queen of uh, the Netherlands 
went to the opening of this huge new neighborhood in 71 because that was the future of cities on different levels with cars going through the buildings, people on the lower floor, uh, and uh, that had to be, but because of different things it became one of the most dangerous uh, places in the Netherlands and they started demolishing uh, most of these blocks except some of them. But then they invited the Chinese some years ago and uh, they had no problem when seeing that. They said, well, we can build this twice as high as you have it here and twice as long. So, of course, issues of scale uh, of uh, how cities have been growing. This was built in, on the outskirts of Amsterdam, but now it's absolutely part of the city. It's very well connected. It's yeah, somehow outskirts. So these topics also come, kind of uh, become as important as heritage, star architecture, um, and, yeah, and some other infrastructures became, you saw that there were two winners, one was the Waterloo uh, train station, the other one was airports, so that had to do with transport in, in Europe. Um, and you do see it through through some of these projects. We always try to show, or online you can show, see all the 300 projects that have been nominated. That explains a little bit more what's happening. And five, try to summarize a little bit of that. Thank you very much, Ivan. You're welcome.